Right, so last time we had this idea of a game that contains a load content method, a draw method, and an update method. And we said that the update method is the one that actually updates the game. And the one you can see on the slide just does two things. It makes the X value of the ball rectangle bigger, and it makes the Y value of the ball rectangle bigger, both of those increasing by one. If I do that kind of thing in my game program, here we are, then this is the program we were working on last week at the end of the lecture. And if I, am I in mouse mode? I am now, that's good. If I go up into update here, then this is uh, what I was doing last week. I had the X value increasing by one. And if I run the program, I lose my microphone. Good. Uh, then the yellow ball moves across the red brick background and disappears off the end. But this is the fundamental by which your games work. If I do the same thing with Y, uh, which means I can use the evil that is block copy to do that. So here I can do that. And so now what will happen is it'll sail down the screen diagonally, I think. So I'll do that as well. And what will happen now is my program will make the ball go diagonally. And this is how games work. There you go, now it's going down. And it won't do any bouncing because it isn't that clever just yet. It just goes straight through the bottom, disappears off the screen, and, and that's the end of that. Um, hmm. So you can have fun with this. Ball rectangle dot width equals ball rectangle. Well, let's do the plus plus because plus plus means make it one bigger. Um, and then so now what it'll do is it'll um, well, that's what it does do. It goes, which is quite fun. Uh, and so one of the things, one of the effects you can get, if you do the same thing with the height, this is what it gets. I quite, I quite, in, oh, this, is, this is what interests me about games. All rectangle dot height plus plus, same time. So now, Now we've got a ball that's coming towards us, and that's kind of weird. It's not coming towards us, it's just getting bigger and moving down the screen. But that's kind of how it looks. One of the things that intrigues me massively is just how easy it is to make fake 3D effects just by fiddling with the size and the position. And uh, there's a trick you can use called, have anyone heard of parallax scrolling? Parallax scrolling works because if you sit on a train and look out the window, the trees go whoosh past the window. The ones close to the railway line go whizzing past, but a church in the distance hardly moves at all. So what parallax scrolling does is it says make all the big things move fast and the small things move slowly, and it looks like 3D, and draw from the back going forwards, and you get a wonderful fake 3D effect for virtually nothing. So you can have fun with this, and uh, I'd advise you to do that. Uh, so. As far as I'm concerned, though, for now, it's an update method. It's running how many times a second? Who said 60? OK. I have brought the cheese with me. This is actually special cheese. This cheese actually kind of glows in the dark. In the, oh. So there you go, there's a piece of glow-in-the-dark cheese. Right, there you go. Um, yeah, that's, that's luminescent cheese. There's only about six pieces of that in the world uh, that I've made. <laughs> so, I digress. 60 times a second this gets called. 60 times a second we increase the values of x and y by 1, and it moves down at that particular rate. And that's all fine and dandy. One of the problems you have... Shh, if you try and use this in real life, there is a kind of problem, which is that these values here are integers. So making things move really slowly is hard if you just use the rectangle. So you have to use a vector or something that contains floating point and then convert integers to place the thing. But there are ways you can do that. Like I said, 60 hertz. Um, you can actually make it free run if you want. If you make it free run, you use this parameter here, the game time value. And what that tells you is how long it is since you were last actually called. Uh, and what you do is you multiply the speed by the time and that gives you how far you travel because that's what Newton says. Well, it's one of the rare occasions where knowing a bit of Newtonian physics is a good thing. 
uh, s equals u t plus a half a t squared. Yeah. Okay, what does that mean? Well, the s equals u, the easy bit is distance equals distance plus time times velocity, uh, which is kind of what we're doing here. But since time is constant, we just add the v on. That's the v of 1. I multiply it by the time, it takes me how far it, it's been since last time we were called. That's all kind of funky and works very well. Uh, but a uh, bit beyond the scope for now, uh, just keep moving forward. So at the end of last week's lecture, this is kind of where we were. Uh, we have a, a raw ability to move things around the screen, uh, which kind of pleases us. Um, and so now we, what we can do is drop out of this, oh, eventually, go away from that, go into here, and then do a slideshow from the beginning. That's the first one, this is the second one. Does it all make sense, by the way? Games are fun, I like writing games, because with games there's no real wrong answer. Whatever it does can quite often be interesting. Uh, and I've actually surprised myself by things I've managed to make just by fiddling with code and seeing what it does in the game. So, X and A, yep. It's a framework for game writing. We can make it in studio. Um, last time I got a ball to move. Now let's make it bounce and uh, uh, create paddles and control them from the game pad or the keyboard and then we can build a game. Um, I can the speed of one is not very impressive. The speed of three is probably more useful. So what I'll do is I'll just drop into my program and give it some ball speed. So here we're going to go. Uh, this is my little area of game variables. So I'm going to go int, um, what are they called? Let's just steal these two guys and drop them in here. And then in here, I'm going to go e equals ball rectangle plus x ball speed. Oh, it didn't work. Why didn't that work? x ball speed, thank you. And then this guy we can go plus ball y speed there. So now it's going to go a little bit faster. We won't make it grow anymore, which is a bit sad. But now it will zoom down between three times the speed. There it goes. So we're okay with that, right, fine. So that's how we're gonna use the speed in the game and uh, from current slide. So in real life, the bottom bullet point's really important. In real life, I'd work out the speed based on the size of the screen. Because in real life, if you write a proper game, you might find one person playing on a 12 inch tablet, another person using a four inch uh, pocket PC or, or Android tablet or whatever. If you keep the speeds the same, it makes a difference to the gameplay. Uh, so you have to be a bit careful about screen resolutions and sizes because this is at the moment adding pixels. We'll talk about that a little bit later, but I think everyone's okay with that. And that's the code you've just seen. So we're now moving the ball by the amount of the X and Y speed variables, which contain uh, a delta, if you like, to apply to the position each time round the loop. Um, this is the most important, yes, yeah, this is a, a hard piece of graphics to draw. Um, if you look at this, actually it works better for the recordings if I go like this. That's the top left-hand corner of the screen because X and A, like WPF, puts the axis, the origin and whatnot, top left-hand corner. So zero, zero is up here, top left-hand corner. And then the screen goes across to the width and down to the bottom and the idea is that uh, we don't want the paddle, sorry the ball, to go off the screen. So if y becomes less than 0 it's going off the top, we don't want that. If x becomes less than 0 it's going off the left. If x plus the width of the ball gets bigger than the width of the screen it's going off that edge and if x plus the height, of, sorry, and if y plus the height of the texture uh, is bigger than the height, it's going off there. So there's four different ways the ball is going to bounce. Okay? And so what we have to do is detect those situations and change the speed of the ball in that direction to reflect this. So I do something like this. The first segment, this one here, increments the speed, moves you on to the next to position, moves you to the next position, and then the second statement 
is, <laughs> I'm not particularly proud of it, but it kind of works. If the x value is less than zero, or the x value plus the width of the ball, the rectangle width, is bigger than the width of the viewport, then we multiply the speed by minus one. So if it's going left, it will now go right. If it's going right, it will now go left. And that, surprisingly, actually sort of mostly nearly usually works. So if I go into here, just drop out, I will steal this code. So go get that, because I'm building the game up by hand from scratch. So we do the move, then we do the test. And so that means that if it's off the left or it's off the right, we reverse the speed and that will do my bouncing in X and um, I will do the same thing in Y but I have to do it by hand so I'll use the evil that is block copy watch carefully so what's happening Rob? what have I just done? I don't think I need that line twice otherwise really weird stuff will happen so if, if Y is less than not or but, oh gosh, ha! Huh. Ball rectangle y is less than naught. Oh, stop it! I know what I'm doing. Or ball rectangle dot y plus ball rectangle dot height is greater than graphics viewport dot height. Then we change the y speed. I got one wrong. Yeah, I have. Haven't I? I've got. I've got an extra chevron up here. Stupid keyboard. <clears throat> yeah, right. So, let's run it and see if it works. Yeah, but doing. Doing, doing. That's bouncing. Isn't that sweet? I like that. That's kind of pleasing. And it really looks as if it's bouncing, uh, which it sort of is. And uh, that will now bounce around forever. And uh, you can see in here, great things about C-sharp, whatever. I could put breakpoints in and detect when it bounces. Bang, there you are. So it's taking the value of that thing from minus three to three. So it's bouncing uh, uh, up, I think, on that one. Run it on and it keeps going. And, and there you are. So you've got a bouncing ball. Is that okay? We all kind of had this working in the lab on Thursday. So uh, no big surprises there. Stop the program. Go back to the code. The paddle. Yeah, that's vaguely artistic. <clears throat> I'm quite proud of that one. Um, and uh, I made it from a texture. Let's get the screen where it should be from current slide, bang. So it's another resource which I load into my game. Uh, so now I have a ball, a left paddle and a right paddle. Uh, and uh, I bring those things in and I use them appropriately, put rectangles in to dimension them, all that kind of good stuff. Um, Here's a trick which I play a lot. I actually get hold of the width, divide it by, say, 20, and that means that my ball is now a 20th of the size of the screen. And I can do that so that it doesn't matter how big my assets are, they'll look right on this device. Uh, one of the things that kind of goes against that, which is annoying, is if you play a game on a, big, on, on a PC, then the sprites can be of a certain size, if you play a game on a small device, a handheld, then what you find is if you scale the sprites and just keep the same game going, the users don't like it very much. Um, a handheld game will have fewer, larger sprites because the users like it that way. Uh, and that can cause a little bit of difficulty when you start scaling things backwards and forwards. But I'll leave that for you folks to find out. Um, this is my code that draws all the objects in my Pong game. This is what you were playing with last week in the labs. Um, and you were drawing a ball, uh, a left paddle and a right paddle. And uh, those are the objects in the game that uh, you're placing on the screen. Um, if you want to, and this actually I think, well, now nah, won't work for X and A, but if you're writing a Windows 10 game, you can plug a Xbox One controller in using USB cab uh, cable and use that but that won't work with X and A. The old school wired Xbox 360 controllers do work fine. 
plug it into your PC, it lights up and away you go. You can plug four in if you like and have four player games. And if you do that, you can then read the, the button instances from it like this. So you say to the gamepad, get me the state. If the, here's the code. Ask the gamepad for its state. If is connected, ooh, back again. If this guy is true, it means that pad is connected. And then what you can do is uh, you can check to see if up is pressed. Uh, and if up is pressed, then we can do things with the Y value else, or we can do other things, and so it goes, and so it goes. Um, this is actually clever code. Uh, what does it do? Anyone know? The site tells you. This is AI. We now have a game with some AI in it. Awesome source. What do I mean by AI? Yeah? Uh, the panel follows the ball by itself. Yeah, I'll go with that. That's worth a piece of cheese. The panel follows the ball by itself. It's artificial intelligence. And so I'll give you a piece of cheese for that. There you go. I've only got three or four of these. Uh, uh, there you go. Weird stuff. Yeah, that's weird. Okay, so yeah. The way it works is that if the. Shh. If the paddle's connected, we read the up thing, and if it's up, we move the paddle up. There's also a corresponding test for down, to move the pedal down. Else, we take the Y value of the paddle and set it to the Y value of the ball, so it tracks it. So if the human being isn't present, what you get is an unbeatable opponent. Now, I love this about XNA. It's smart enough to work correctly whether or not a paddle's plugged in. So you can get that wonderful effect that if I plug the paddle in, the ball will stop tracking, the bat stops tracking the ball and the player has to control it. If you remove the paddle, it becomes an AI. And that's quite a nice trick. Um, and uh, <clears throat> yeah, keep that in mind, it's a good one. If you don't want to use controllers, <clears throat> then we can read the keyboard and in fact that's what you're doing in the lab on Thursday and we can tell if keys are being pressed or released. Uh, we use a very very similar pattern and we can look for keys dot A, B, C, D, left shift, right shift, left, uh, uh, alt, left, right, alt, the space bar also works as do uh, the numbers and whatnot. The only problem with this is there's no way of telling whether the keyboard's plugged in or not, whether there is a keyboard, so you can't just decide to use the keyboard because it might not be present. You can plug a keyboard into an Xbox if you wish to do that. And in the olden days, you, you could control games in X and A on an Xbox 360 with a keyboard, but um, if it's a PC, there's a good chance there'll be a keyboard there. You could say press A to continue and wait a while and see what they do. <laughs> Although don't say press any key because they can't find the key with the word any written on it. Uh, and that slows them down a bit. So, everyone okay with that? We can move, you, you did this in the lab, correct? Yes? Right, okay, fine. To detect collisions, we have to detect this rectangle intersection thing. Uh, and the idea here is that, uh, I'm gonna really piss off the people watching the recording and draw some stuff on the whiteboard now. <laughs> so, I'm gonna do this. If that's my ball, okay, and then my back is, say, here, then what the system does is it detects inter intersections between the two rectangles, okay? So this guy is bounded by a rectangle, this guy is bounded by a rectangle, and the dot intersects method says, do these two textures, so rectangles, actually intersect? Now, I've drawn this deliberately to show there's something of a problem with this. Do those two rectangles intersect? Yes. Yes. Should that mean we've hit the ball? No, no. No. Um, there's a fundamental issue with this particular version of collision <laughs> detection, which is that actually, because balls are kind of roundy round, and rectangles are kind of squarey square this is technical stuff if you can get this you're doing well then doesn't always work like this so what will happen in the game if you do that what's the effect on the gameplay 
What'll happen for the player? They'll, they'll hit the ball where they didn't think they should. Uh, and everybody here has played a game where they've been killed when they didn't think they should be. Correct? When the bullet whistles past your head and then you're suddenly told you've been killed. Hate that, okay? This is basically the same problem, but in 2D. And so this is actually uh, a nasty. X and A is very simplistic. It just says, if the two rectangles intersect, then hey, wow, we've got a collision. And in this particular case, what happens is we reverse the direction of the ball so that it bounces off the bat. And so if it comes down here this way, it hits the bat and then goes off that way, say. Okay? Now, if your players start giving you bad reviews because the ball collision's not very friendly, how do you fix this? How do you solve the problem? Shh. Any ideas? Yeah? Yeah, that was what I'd do. Absolutely. I don't think it's worth the piece of cheese. It's a great idea, though, because what happens is at this point, normally the class goes off on one and says, we well, do pixel level collision detection. What you do is you look through this area here, try to find a pixel in there and a pixel in there that correspond. And if there's a pixel in there and a pixel in there, it means they have collided and it's a collision. So you can, you can throw lots of extra processing power at it and do it that way. Or you can do what that man said, which is basically make the ball a square ball. And, and so you make the ball square and this thing square as well and it's fine and that is what I did when people said ah the ball keeps going past the bat or hitting the bat when it shouldn't right fine the ball is now square problem solved and that's a really important game developers point which is that if you're writing a game you control the entire universe you control everything so if you want to change how it works and what it does then absolutely do that to make your life easier the only situation when that's not the case is when you're doing the acw because <laughs> we can't have you changing the spec for that so in the acw you're controlling the skier going on a cross-country ski road uh, avoiding flags and being attacked by the only horizontal avalanche we've ever seen <laughs> where you've got snowballs coming across trying to knock him out, out, off his feet now I'm afraid for the, the, the skiing game you're going to have to hit our spec because otherwise we can't give you any marks but if you're writing games for three thing game or for the hell of it and you find a weird collision behaviour put it in the game <laughs> change the spec of the game to match it um, and that works really well so shh. we can detect when the ball hits the edges because we know when the x value hits the value so we can see that because we do that when we're bouncing um, drawing text is done using these sprite font things uh, that's one issue that I had with my <coughs> X and A installation on the PC and that the sprite fonts didn't kind of gel properly so um, you may notice that if, if you do then uh, um, yeah uh, let me know and I'll, I'll see what I can sort out if anything sprite fonts are defined as a lump of XML which is rendered when the game is actually built uh, and the interesting things in here are the font name which is Arial and the font size which by default is 14 which is a bit measly change those numbers and those names to get bigger more interesting fonts and different font sizes do bear in mind though if you ship the game to somebody else and you use a built-in font on your PC that they haven't got their game won't look as nice as yours does it might get rendered differently so do bear that in mind loading a font is just like loading any other piece of content you bring it in as uh, uh, through the content load mechanism saying I want a sprite font please and then when you do that you can ask the font to actually draw text and that now renders the words hello world at 100 100 in white using the font we downloaded and so you, you draw strings in the same way as you draw other things in your game in the draw method and so you can now use that to pop scores and things up as well um, that's my pong game which uh, i haven't released just yet because it kind of ruins the lab um, but uh, 
it works, it works. You can plug the controllers in and out or the keyboard. Because one of the things you can do, this is a very good trick, write your program so it works with gamepad or keyboard automatically. So you check the keyboard and, and the gamepad. That way you can handle pretty much anything. And that was my Pong game, of which I am, of course, extremely proud. Uh, cornflower blue and everything. So people seem to quite enjoy the lab. I saw a few people getting some quite nice looking bits and pieces going. And uh, as a starter for XNA for the coursework, it ain't a bad thing to do. Anyone got any questions on XNA before we go on to the next bit? Yes, no, whatever. The thing about XNA is that if you really want to progress with it, you should move on to a thing called Mono Game, which is XNA but more portable, uh, and also with a future. Uh, and that one's available uh, as a free download. And then you can make games for. I've actually seen this one three thing game that we did. Um, we actually had the guys wrote the game in XNA and had it going on an Android tablet uh, the following afternoon. Uh, so it's actually quite an easy thing to do. Uh, I think that we have a date for the next three thing game and it's going to be the 15th of April. So make a note in your diary uh, for that. Uh, and uh, so we'll have, uh, it's, the, it's the end of the second week back. Uh, I wanted to have it on April the 1st, but that doesn't work this year. Apparently it's 40, it is a Friday, but it's a Friday you aren't here. You come back on the 4th, so you have a week here and then we'll do the registration that week and then the following week we'll do the actual game thing. So that's how it's going to be and let's now look at getting started with XNA. No, let's find ourselves another subject and then we're in business. So gosh this text is small. This text is tiny. Okay, this is fun. This is really interesting. I say that a lot, but that's because I find it interesting. Right. Shh. <coughs> Inheritance. We're going back to the bank. Remember the bank? Happy memories. Paying in money, making ourselves rich by adding bugs to the code. All that kind of stuff. Yep, yeah, right, fine. Now, one of the things about customers is that... Uh, Occasionally they have ideas and things that they want and uh, so, so that, that's fine, I'm going to pay you, that's fine. Um, this time the bank managers had this idea, there's a, there's a big hidden market for bank users which is babies. Babies don't have bank accounts, wouldn't it be great if they did? Uh, if taking candy from a baby is easy, maybe taking money from a baby is easy as well. So the bank manager thinks that a brilliant idea is to start offering bank accounts to babies. Um, with a small provisor that they can't draw up more than five quid at any given time. Okay, so, uh, uh, so the idea is that we're going to make a bank account exactly like a proper one, but you can't draw out more than a fiver in any given transaction. Is everyone okay with that? That's the problem. The business model is that we think that babies are an untapped market, uh, so we're going to actually add babies to our bank account behaviour. And uh, there's several ways we could do this. One way is to take the normal account class, <coughs> block copy it, because block copy is of course our friend, <laughs> no it isn't, and change the name to baby account, and then once we've done that, we can then actually uh, create a list of accounts in our bank and a list of babies in our bank, and we can then actually um, manage these accounts as baby accounts. Um, that would be a pain, we need two different storage arrays and if we change the way that accounts work we have to update both the account and the baby account classes. So that's not a good way to do it. Now the, the baby account example is actually fairly stupid because we're not going to have babies in our bank. But if you think about things like Windows Presentation Foundation where you've got a whole screen full of different kinds of display elements, you start to shh. You start to find that some things on the screen have properties that everybody shares, like position and size, 
and some things on the screen have properties that only they use like text boxes or images or calendar controls or stack panels or whatever. So it makes sense for the stack panel and the text box and the image to all share the same position behaviour in a parent class somewhere. So inheritance does make sense and in this particular context the example is not necessarily the strongest one but I want you to understand this because from a program design point of view inheritance is incredibly useful. It's also very useful in games. If you have a thing at the top called sprite that has position and a texture and below that you have player sprite controlled by the gamepad and alien sprite who will chase after the player and then we have different kinds of aliens that behave differently you can see that replacing particular behaviours especially the update one in game sprites is a really good idea so what we're doing here is the same thing but inside our bank and the way you do it is by using a, a technique called extending the parent class and making a new child so we extend our bank account class and make a new child class called baby account say and the thing that you need to remember about this that's really important is that the child in this scenario <clears throat> can always do at least as much as the parent. So the child picks up all the parent behaviours and then customises them and adds to them. So we can add new methods to the child, new properties, whatever, and it picks up the behaviours of the parent one and adds those and off it goes. If you think about my WPF example, that makes really good sense. The parent's got all the stuff to do with where it is on the screen that everybody needs. And the text box has all that plus its text boxness. Text block, same kind of thing. Button, same kind of thing. So you build up a class hierarchy so you can share implementations down a whole family of related items. And that's the basis of inheritance. That's kind of what we're doing. This is my diagram at the moment because we have the object type that we know is the parent of everything underneath that we have an account class which goes in one direction and the bank class in the other and the bank acts as a container for the account we know that too so that's how inheritance looks at the moment we're going to actually build on this in the same way that we built on the object type uh, and looked at the equals and the two string methods uh, and customize those we did this previously with the account and other classes and the bank as well now we're going to make a child and override methods we placed in the class above that as well so yeah when we did the bank we overrode two string and made our own version we're perfectly happy with doing that um, it's not the same as overloading absolutely not overloading means I've got the same name but a different signature Overriding means I'm replacing the one in the parent class, please. There's a, there's a big difference. You have, you have to remember the two things. And uh, so, yeah, let's start playing with this. This is an account. Shall I? Uh, yeah, let's make it. Let's do the code thing. So I'll go into my game and I'll make a, make a new solution. I think I'll do it as a console app. So I'll go in here and make it one of these. And I'll go, I don't know, baby account. Yeah, why not? So up it comes, and I go into here, and I'll steal this code from the slide. Come back. Thank you. There's my account class. I wonder if this will paste correctly. Let's see, shall we? <laughs> Yay, I'm getting better at this. So that's my account class with a withdraw fund. You okay with that? It's just a very tiny one. It's no constructor, the balance is public, it's all dead dodgy, but it's an account, we're all right with that. And it has a fixed amount in the account and a single withdraw funds method, and I can actually do things like this. Let's uh, copy that and go into here and then go account A 
a equals new account, make ourselves a new account, and then I can ask it, I can do this, ask it for six quid, will that work? Yeah, because he's got 10 quid, he's fine. So run the program, if you don't believe me, and why would you, run the program, hit the withdraw funds method, step into it like a good one, in it goes, is the amount less than the balance, the amount is six, the balance is 10, all's well with the world, bang, bang, take the money, return true, all's good. Then write the message, it all worked. Okay, so, happy endings all round, everybody happy. Happy, happy, happy. Right, okay, isn't that good? So, I want to make a baby account which behaves exactly like an ordinary account, except you can't have more than five pounds out of it. And I do this by extending the account class, creating a child called baby account, and then overriding the withdraw funds method. And this is the code that does that, okay? So, the statement here, I will do it on the slide so it'll record. This is new, colon, class that I'm extending. If you think about it, there's a colon object after every class we have ever created. Because everything we make extends the object class. <clears throat> the compiler puts it in for us if we leave it out. So if we don't say we're extending anything, the compiler goes, OK, you're extending object. If we do say we're extending something, we give the name of the class we're extending on top. So now, baby account can do everything which account can do. OK? And then, inside the class, I can produce new versions of methods in the parent. In this case, I'm going to, this is actually kind of clever. It's got the word override, it's overriding. Um, there's a little bit of extra tomfoolery I have to do in that we have to flag a method as being overridable before we can override it. So I have to flip back into the account class and make a change. I'll do that in a second. Um, anyone know why we do that? We want to stop people from overriding this thing without our say so. So we flag it as being overridable and then the outside world can override it. There's a second reason for doing it which is to do with efficiency, which is that if a method flagged as overridden, the runtime system goes off and looks for methods that might override it, which is a bit time consuming. If the method isn't flagged as overridden, it doesn't have to do that. So it's a, it's a, it's a performance trick. It's also a make your program easier trick. But once you've overridden it, well, when it runs, this one runs in place of the original. And this is really clever. I like this a lot, because this is kind of magical. If I want to, I can use the word base to call the method in the parent class to do the rest of the behavior. So what this says is, if they're asking for more than a fiver, give up, because they're babies, they can't have that fiver. If they're not, use the base withdraw funds method and see what that does. Because that's the one that checks how much money they've got, and I don't want to have to do that. And besides, I haven't got access to the balance value because although you extend the class and get all its members and properties, you don't get access to them unless they're public. So I can't touch the balance anyway. And so, yeah, that's the actual hierarchy. And the thing to bear in mind is the bottom bullet point, which is really important to me, the lower down the hierarchy, the more a class can do. So baby account's got more in it than account, which has got more in it than object. Uh, and so the lower you go down the, the list, the, the more things you've got. So if I go back here now, I can just drift back to there. That's my account. That's my using the account. Here's my baby account. Let's just steal this code. Control C, go into here and hit Control V. Will this work? Yes, probably good. Right, so, will this compile? 
Yes or no? Do we care? I want to ask that one. It won't compile because. Will it compile? I bet it won't. I once, actually, <laughs> there you go. I once bet uh, an audience a million pounds that something would work, and it didn't. And I still owe that money. I lie awake at night worrying about it. The reason why it works is because I've been clever in advance. I've actually marked the thing as virtual already. So I shouldn't have done that, never mind. So I now have a, a withdraw funds that runs inside baby. What I want to show you is this. Change that to a baby account. Change this to a baby account. Run the program again and step through it. Run the program. When I hit the withdraw funds, which withdraw funds will run? The one in the baby. So the baby one runs, it's bigger than five, return false, game over. Okay, so if we try and uh, withdraw six quid, ain't gonna work. Let's try and withdraw four. Off we go. Should this work? Yes, it should. Step in. Is the amount bigger than five? Four is not bigger than five, so I think we should keep going. Now, this is the bit that, this is the science bit, if you like. This bit I like, we say, okay, the baby reckons it's okay. Let's see what the parent class thinks. So, bang. Now we jump in here, look at the amount. It's still four. The balance is ten. We're all good. Doink, 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 and we're good. So, I quite like this code. It's kind of clever because it makes use of the parent method to do some of the heavy lifting in a way that it really has to because it doesn't know how to withdraw money from the parent. It isn't allowed to do that. So the nice thing about class hierarchies is that I can target the specific behaviors that I need to have work differently inside the object and pick up all the original stuff. So I'm dealing in deltas and inheritance makes it possible to do one thing that I'm very keen on which is to write every single piece of code exactly once. I write it at one place in the class hierarchy and I reuse it everywhere else. Children pick that behavior up. So if I fix a bug in my behavior, I fix it in one place and everyone else in the entire tree who needs to use that picks it up and uses it. I'll go through this again tomorrow because it's kind of interesting and a little bit sort of complicatory um, and then we'll take it from there. Okay? Five